what I think people don't realize, right, is that that changes the relationship to the content that's that's playing. So all of a sudden, I am loyal to TikTok. People say, I love TikTok. So you're yep. going into that expecting like huge rewards. And sometimes you might get it. Maybe you'll make mm -hmm. like $12,000, you know, yeah. and other times you'll be like, oh, I made eight hundred dollars off of yeah, all of these like views that picture was just arbitrarily chosen mm -hmm. by by my editor at the time and i'm like sure we'll go with this and like yeah little did i know 13 years later i'd still be like sure we're still gonna go with this <laughs> uh we're gonna keep it like we are at c coming up on an age where there will have to be more restrictions and warnings on the things that we consume Welcome to Days at Night, Matt Pat. I am glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh. It. Of course. Not a problem. I mean, I one does not turn down an invite from you. Oh my goodness. Stop it. Don't, don't hide me out that much. What? People I mean, are going to be like, who the hell fault. is she? <laughs> <laughs> well, after we met, I, I had to do my my research on you. But no, you, you passed all inspections. It's Did all I? Good. It's it's a very oh, it's a yes. It's a very robust process. But no, you're you're in the clear, so it's it's good to go. That feels so good. That I'm glad that you went full research on it, and you're like, yeah, okay. She's. I mean, is is that a surprise to literally anyone? No. Who's ever heard of who I am and what we do? It's <laughs> like, very you, wait, of course. What Matt Pat did a lot of research on a topic and tried really hard. Oh, guys, he here. researched her. That's. Very uncharacteristic. Very unusual behavior from this guy. But honestly, it is a little unusual since you're supposed to be retired. You're supposed to be relaxing. Uh, I, see, the thing is, and I think the, I think the thing that people forget is like the channel was always just an extension of me. Of you course. know, it was a distillation of one facet of my personality that that desire to optimize and over research everything. And so, well, you can take the channel out of the man. You can't, you can't take, take the man the, out of the channel. Well, no, yeah, I guess he's no. No, your impact yeah, is still there. I, yeah, I've, I've done, right, exactly. The the channel is still a part of me. It's been in my heart the whole time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You'll, you'll be in my heart. Yes, you'll be in my heart, as Phil Collins. It's beautiful. Well, That's Phil Collins beautiful. is the goat, but also you're kind of the goat because I also like to research things, and you were high school valedictorian at your school. But, ah, yeah, <laughs> I, I was. Yes, well, well researched. Yeah, you've always been very analytical, and you, yeah, I, when you went to college, you mm -hmm. were really, you were really casting a broad net out there because you're working on your oh, acting career right i was and yep. then you were also majoring in psychology with an emphasis on neuroscience very cool that is correct yes uh-huh i i wanted to be able to act any character i wanted to but then be able to tell you whether ha they had an anal fixation on the other side <laughs> <laughs> so, so i do a freudian analysis and like oh this guy's definitely got an oedipal complex absolutely 100 percent. it makes total um, sense look at his relationship yeah. with his mother that's why he treats his wife the way that he does Exactly. It allows you to get to the core essence of the characters that you're playing. Um, no, it, it was it was just the, the things that I was always really fascinated in. So, yes, you're absolutely right. I was a Val Victorian of my uh, high school. I got a really cool medallion. I did oh, get yeah. to speak to my graduating class, which I was always a little bit sad. And Why? About. Why not? I had, I, you know, I, I don't know, man. That's part of the flex, is it not? That you get to get right? up there? You, you would think that. You'd think that that's like the perk to it. But yeah. uh, no, that, that sadly didn't. They, they had to keep me down, man. All this uh, work so I decided to make a YouTube channel me. so I could speak to the masses. Well, yeah, <laughs> um, your YouTube channel is cool, though, because like the timeline of it, I watched, I went deep in there. I, I watched a you style video on you, literally. Oh, n nice. Yeah, awesome. classic. But your timeline is like you changed your channel a lot from what it was initially intended for. But even your initial intent for your content was really interesting and cool to me because I went to acting school, so I was eating yeah. it up. Oh, sure. I mean, back in the day, it wasn't even intended to be a channel, right? Like yeah. YouTube at its core, like if you go back to the earliest videos on, on Game Theorist, like at its core, it was literally meant to be just a repository of videos, which was how people were using YouTube at the time, right? I had a collection of clips from the various theater shows that I was in or the various theater shows that I directed. And I'm like, I need a place to showcase to potential employers that I can sing, dance, act, and I can direct things, you know? And that was it. Yeah. And eventually it was like, people were like, YouTube is the new television and you can create shows on YouTube. And, and this is the, the next era of entertainment. And I'm like, I, I, I believe in that. Yeah. At which point I started the channel as a means of, uh, you know, showcasing a different set of skills and a, a different set of talents to potential employers. And that's where, where game theory was born. 
Yeah, and you kind of cut out the middleman. Like you were on the like the cutting edge of new media in that way. Oh, yeah. I mean, back in the day, the idea of making a living off your YouTube career, off of being a digital person, didn't really exist, right? Like yeah. I got started. I, I think the YouTube partner program had just begun. Um, but this was back in the day when you needed to join a, a multi-channel network to change your thumbnails or, or do a custom <laughs> banner and things like it's that. It's crazy. Um, we didn't monetize the first you know first three years of videos or something like, like that wow. i was i was always so scared of copyright you know i'm like uh you know we're talking about all these video games that are other people's ip and i'm using assets and, and dancing yeah. them around and this and that it's like those aren't mine i don't know if i can monetize any of this and eventually it came out that the video game companies were like this is fine this is fair use and we're like great let's go ahead and start monetizing some of these and but it, it was much much deeper into youtube than it, than most other people get started for sure yeah definitely and like it's kind of weird we talked about this a little bit in like real life when we were first meeting but Talking the pendulum's kind of swing wild concept, i know i know it's real crazy. life not just internet friends real life friends no real can you friends, believe it absolutely real friends but the pendulum's kind of swinging now where you're seeing like especially on tiktoks you know it's it's brutal out there with the short form but yeah we're seeing a lot of creators who like, you know, quit their day jobs, move to L.A. or New York because they got a million followers. And now they're having mm -hmm. to make videos like I have to get a day job because this isn't it's not sustainable anymore. What do you think like the trajectory as somebody who has done YouTube for so long with such great success and then is like one of the most like iconic retirement situations for like a creator so far? No, seriously, though, people were freaking out because you're doing something really cool and like there's not a blueprint for it yet and so people yeah. like respect it and they're like now i know where i like where i can go with this sure. do you think that that's like going to be a sustainable option five ten years from now uh, being a, a content creator yeah. I, I it will be for some um but not for many i think uh yeah if you look at the evolution of the space one of the things that i think with the the surge of short form content Right. Uh, TikTok kind of coming onto the scene and dominating YouTube, having to pivot to shorts to really kind of compete. What you've seen is a breakdown in creator culture in mm -hmm. a lot of ways where you are finding that audiences are more loyal to the scroll and to the feed and to the platforms rather than to the individual creators. You know, if, if you think about your favorite TikToks, right, if you think about like when you talk to people about TikTok, there, it's always like, oh my gosh, you got to see this TikTok. And then it, they spend a, an inordinately long amount of time trying to find it. And then they eventually can't find it. And they're like, okay, I'll, I'll just describe for you what it is. Yeah. Because right? they're like, or I don't remember who it was. It was like some guy doing blah, blah, blah. Right. It's Yeah. And, and they describe it. And you think about the, the UI of TikTok or shorts, right, for that matter, because they're basically the same thing, which is any channel branding, any logo, whatever you have, any video title is off in like the tiny bottom corner. It's mostly transparent. and You mm -hmm. got to like really seek it out to click on it. What you really are trained to do is just like watch the video, scroll, watch the video, scroll, watch the video, scroll. And what I think people don't realize, right, is that that changes the relationship to the content that's that's playing. So all of a sudden, I am loyal to TikTok. People say, I love TikTok, yeah. not I love this creator on TikTok. You still find that for sure. And, th and there are people who have been able to brand themselves smartly, deliver reliable content, things like that, and carve out that, that brand for themselves. But it's harder on short form platforms because of that. Um, and as a result, you lose a lot of kind of what has made YouTube special and what's made the creator economy such a big force over the last decade, which is I go to YouTube, I search for MatPat, Game Theory, PewDiePie, Markiplier, whatever, and I go to their channel, I go to their channel page, it is Markiplier's channel. Yeah. And just like you have a CBS or an NBC, I go there to watch their content, their shows, their formats. Um, but these platforms, because the algorithms are just feeding you that, you don't have you don't have to know that stuff. You don't yeah. You don't search for that stuff. It's just being delivered to you. And if you like it, great. If you don't like it, you swipe to the next one. True. Um, and they kind of don't want so, you to know also. Like when you follow yeah. people, a real common complaint is like, I I follow all these creators. I never see them on my For You page because yeah. no one ever checks the following tab. Like it exists, but no one. Right. I'll, I'll yeah, click no. on it and then click away right away. 
Right, exactly. And and to be honest, like the reason makes a lot of sense, right? Because at the end of the day, you look at the history of this space and you look at like the adpocalypses that YouTube has had to go through, right? When all of a sudden you have a lot of people loyal to one or two creators, mm -hmm. you know, even a subset of creators, if that person does something wrong, if that person gets canceled, if that person retroactively gets canceled, right? All of a sudden you have this huge paranoia uh, with advertisers, advertisers pulling out, they're nervous. Is this platform safe anymore? What regulations come down to kind of police this in the future? And so by making creator or sorry, by making users more attracted to the platform and less creator dependent, now all of a sudden, hey, this creator might have gotten canceled or done a bad thing, or maybe we just don't like the, their style of content anymore. We can kind of shuttle that away and the algorithm kind of hide it off to the sides. It's yeah. not going to appear in the feed anymore. And here's the stuff that we really want you to consume right now. Well, true. And then also, like, if a creator who has, like, a lot of influence, like, let's say, like, a D'Amelio decides that sure. they, they don't want to do TikTok anymore. Yep. Then in the past, like, with a YouTuber, if, if a YouTuber were to switch platforms, like, say, to, like, Twitch or something, a huge mm -hmm. number of people would then fully switch platforms they're not going to just 100%. stop watching youtube but they're not going to be watching their content on youtube anymore whereas with tiktok the crossover rate for changing platforms is very very low yeah yeah absolutely and i think as a result of all of this right going back to your original question from the very beginning yeah is how is this affecting the ability for creators to make a living out of this space i think it's significantly harder you know and i think that's why you're seeing a decline in people being able to make a living out of this i think you are seeing a real big squeeze in what i would call for lack of a better term like the mid-tier creator right mm -hmm. people who are doing this full-time right now and maybe have a small team around them, maybe an editor, maybe a writer, maybe like a team of like three or four people around them, but have just started doing this independently. Now all of a, now all of a sudden, the margins are getting so thin and the revenue is so inconsistent. And I think that's the, the bigger issue. The revenue becomes so inconsistent that it's hard for them to make this a full-time job and a living because they haven't gotten to the scale of some of the largest creators out there. And, and you know, we're fortunate that we're one of those people where we're at a scale where, you know, fluctuations in viewership, fluctuations in ad revenue, things like that. We've planned for that. We're able to adjust for that. Mm -hmm. If YouTube or TikTok suddenly demands more videos from us, we can ramp it up. If they demand longer videos for us, we can kind of pivot our resources and go there. If they're going for one style of content or another, Luckily, we have way too many damn channels on the platform <laughs> that that service literally every corner of the platform from from food to style to gaming. Like yeah. doesn't matter. Like we are there covering it. We can kind of pivot and, and move in those directions. Right. Um, a lot of mid tier creators and these people who are kind of like just starting their ramp up and really starting to scale out their business. They don't have that luxury. They don't have those resources. They don't have that sort of cushion around themselves to sustain those sorts of blows and weather the storm you know like right now it is a tough time economically for everyone yeah. creator economy included and money's more expensive and advertiser dollars are harder to come by and so that's putting the squeeze on a lot of people and when that is your income and you have two three of your friends your family whatever working together on it it's really hard and now all of a sudden you're forced to pump out more videos but quality dips and things like that so you get the squeeze so what you're really seeing is a is a loss of the middle class, uh, and again, I, I hate using this term, but I think it's a good way of just visualizing. No, I think it, it, it is a good analogy. Yeah, and so you you have the people at the top able to kind of weather the storm, you know, and mm -hmm. trying to figure out what their strategies are in kind of this this changing climate, and then you have small creators like the micro creators who just do this for fun or kind of like throw out a, a couple TikToks in there and hey, because it's short form content that's not creator dependent. Each video is kind of like a lottery ticket mm -hmm. and it might go super viral or it might be seen by no one. But if it goes super viral, that's cool. And that's yeah. a huge hit of dopamine. And maybe you get a couple bucks out of it. And, and that's great because you weren't expecting anything. And so now you're like, oh, I, I can maybe buy more of these lottery tickets and produce more content, which is what what the platforms want. So yeah. it's, a, it's a tricky time and it's an evolving time. But, yeah, I think exactly what you said, it is becoming harder to kind of cross that boundary, you know, to yeah. go from. I had a couple viral hits or I had a like a big success here and I want to do this professionally too. Now I'm uh, now I'm up here and I'm I'm stable and I have, you know, this kind of production around me. Yeah, I'm wondering and like you can weigh in on this cuz you probably have some great insight to this cuz you spoke to like the inconsistent like 
revenue for short form, which is yeah. certainly a big problem. Like you'll have a video that has 12 million views or whatever. And typically mm -hmm. like when your video is at like 20,000 views, you get paid a dollar for every 1,000 views. So you're yep. going into that expecting like huge rewards. And sometimes you might get it. Maybe you'll make mm -hmm. like $12,000, you know? Yep. And other times you'll be like, oh, I made $800 off, off yeah, of all of these like views. 400, 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and then I, I see a lot of big creators go and talk to their audiences about that. And then people get upset because it sounds very tone deaf, which in a lot of situations, it certainly can be, especially the way you yeah. deliver it. But there is something to be said for like not knowing what you're gonna make a month at, at least even relatively, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, and this is what I'm interested to see your perspective on, I wonder if that's also intentional or if it's just because these platforms that are short form or like TikTok are a lot newer, so they haven't figured out their pay schedule. Because on the one hand, if it was intentional, it would be a, a strong way to like make it harder to be a, a big creator that the app has mm -hmm. to consistently pay because you would have to be doing so well so regularly that eventually they're like, all right, fine, we'll keep paying you $12,000 for 12 million, million views. Or it could right. just be that it's really disorganized because it's a young platform. Like, what do you think? I mean, I think it's one of those things where it's it's all dependent on advertiser cycles. Like, I, like you, have, you have a couple different problems at play there, right? So one is it's always going to be dependent on advertiser cycles. Mm -hmm. And so even people who just do like one platform on YouTube, right? Like we can tell you that at the end of Q2 and at the end of Q4, ad revenue is going to go up no matter what you're doing because that's when advertiser budgets are being used. You mm -hmm. know, beginning of the year, people are planning out what money they have, they're budgeting out, what big campaigns do we have? How do we want to parcel out that money? And at the end of Q2, that first round of budgets is being used. So that's usually why uh, you see in June, like, hey, there's there's a nice spike there. And then at the end of the year, that's their big spend where you got to use the money or you lose it, basically, if you're these big corporations. And it's the holiday spending season. And so you dump everything in. So you're always going to have this kind of cycle and this flow. Um, but the other half of it, right, is you got to think about the platforms are operating at a macro scale. You know, mm -hmm. all us creator businesses and all of us content creators are operating on a micro scale. How does this video, how does this payment affect us and our bottom line on a on a day-to-day -day basis, on a month-to-month -month basis? But the the platforms are operating on a macro scale. And so while variability for us is detrimental and difficult to deal with and you have to change your strategies and how is this affecting who I'm hiring, what videos I can produce, how expensive those videos are, what those margins look like. When you're talking about the platforms, all they care about is stability of views mm -hmm. and, and growth of views or decline of views across all of us. Yeah. And, and so I think one of the things that you see on like the YouTubes of the world especially is this idea of like they're selling ad campaigns months, quarters, half a year out with mm -hmm. some of the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from the Johnsons and Johnsons of the world and all these big corporations. And when, you know, I'm Johnson and Johnson, I'm like, I got a hundred million dollars to spend across your platform. Put me in front of the, the best content you got. And YouTube's like, great, we can do that. And so as lo and and we can guarantee that at like, say, 500 million views or right. whatever for that campaign. All they have to do is deliver those views. Where exactly they're coming from? It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter as much, right? Like there is a way to scale up that, you know, the amount of views that are going to those channels, the scale down, right? As long as they're hitting that bottom line of like 500 million views or whatever it is. And so at a micro scale, you know, where that money, it's it's like a big old, big old pot of money, right? Yeah. It's getting poured onto all these different channels, right? And to YouTube, as long as that money gets used across some channels, that's fine. They're just doing a big old pour across mm -hmm. everyone. But for the people trying to catch the dollars on the other end, it, it makes a big difference. So I, you're dealing with different people operating at different levels of perspective here and different levels of variability. So the platform wins when there is just stability of views. Mm -hmm. So when TikTok comes in and eats a lot of YouTube's views and starts declining views across the platform, that's scary for YouTube. But when, you know, creators see like less views on their individual videos, that's scary for creators. So it's it's a different scale that you're working at. Yeah, that makes complete sense to me. I think there's also a lot of concerns about like quality control because of sure. how inconsistent things are. Because a lot of creators like on TikTok, they're, they're straight up leaving. You know, they're trying to go yeah. to YouTube because they don't want to do like a freaking Amazon storefront every day. Sure. Like they're, they, they got into it to be creatives, not to be salespeople. Yep. You know, well, and I, and I think that's yeah, I, I think that is 
one of the things that we're going to see how it plays out over the next couple of years, because I think that is the dilemma that these platforms are going to start seeing mm -hmm. is if people aren't able to make a career out of this and if there isn't some level of stability where you know the next game theorist can can appear or the next mr beast can appear or you know things like that you know if creators aren't incentivized to build out their teams and kind of make regular videos and, and create this into a, a sustainable living does that engender loyalty on the platform like can one-off videos actually create the level of loyal viewership and ecosystem that allows a platform to really thrive and advertisers to want to go in there. Um, you know, I think one thing that we've seen time and time again is that the advertisers are scared away or are nervous to kind of invest in short form content. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why, you know, YouTube shorts tends to be uh, undersold and why TikTok ad rates are very variable and, and tend to be lower, right, is because advertisers are nervous about short form content it feels less premium mm -hmm. they want to advertise in front of the stuff that feels flashy and and big and has sizable audience and looks premium right because yeah. it looks good to the boss it feels good to advertise in front of and it it's just good brand awareness right that's why youtube has a whole separate category of creators and videos dedicated to youtube select i think right. it's, it's it's changed brands like three or four times already. yeah I think right now it's youtube select <laughs> i think it is um yeah, right. But it's like the best of the best on the platform. And it's it, it's TV quality and people are watching it mostly on TVs and there's a passionate audience and they're tuning in loyally like this is our premium shows. So in an ecosystem where it is hard to kind of pass that bar and, and to make a stable income, am I incentivized to up my production value? Am I incentivized to dedicate more time to uploading on a regular basis? Like mm -hmm. there there's a feedback loop there, right? And I think if the platforms don't address kind of this this mid-tier gap mm -hmm. in a lot of ways you lose a lot of those people kind of investing those resources and able to dedicate their time and energy into making that uh and you lose kind of that that premium access which then loses advertisers which then loses money which hurts your bottom line which dominoes into who is the next platform to kind of rise up and, and try again right right and the other thing that I, I want to talk about with you is like, so one of the reasons you retired is, you know, you want to spend more time with your family. Like you. Yes. I, also, by the way, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just boring you. I, I must be like bo boring you to death with all no. this like, deep, deep talk. about. No, career. it's not. I, I'm like listening to myself. I'm like, is this interesting? No, it is very <laughs> interesting. Is the stuff that I think about. But also, listen, like, I, she must be like hating herself. No, right I, I love it. And the other thing is like you're offering a perspective that like is incredibly invaluable to people who are just now starting out. Out. And you need yeah. to remember that there's there's so many people. Anytime I make a video that goes viral, people are commenting things like, how do I do what you're doing? And what mm -hmm. you're doing is you're breaking down like the the cons of what it is so that yeah. people can understand it. So like, you know, it's not boring. It's, it's really important. And that's also why like th these areas are going to have to be having these conversations because mm -hmm. litigation is going to factor in, which sure. is yep. where I'm going with this. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So okay, I'm, I'm from deeping. monetization to, to regulation. Okay. Yes. Ooh, strap in. Yes. Because like so, you and Steph, placey, loving parents, talk. Yeah, such uh, a sweet couple. Love you guys together. Beautiful couple. And we were talking about like I was asking you because you're a YouTuber, like, what do you do with your your family with YouTube? Because you have like a young yeah. son. And I think you guys have a really clever approach given his like current age. So can you are you yes. comfortable speaking to your current yeah, approach. 100%. So uh, Ollie is currently five and a half. Yeah. And to him, YouTube is the the videos that we download uh, thanks to YouTube Premium and the stuff that he is able to watch on planes. And he knows that like planes are kind of his like free time and whatever. But outside of that, he gets a half hour of screen time and on, on a daily basis. Yeah. And he gets to choose whether that is watching Disney Plus, whether that is watching Netflix, uh, you know, within the curated shows that we have, or if that's like a, a YouTube thing, do you want to watch some YouTube videos? Um, and so for him right now, his his number one favorite YouTuber is Supercar Blondie. And uh, I got huge clout with my five and a half year old by hosting the Streamy Awards last year so I could get a picture with her. That's so, so cute. <laughs> so that was a big way. I'm like, I'm like, hey, I, I'm so I'm, I'm so sorry. I I know how this is to do it to other people, but like, can I get a picture with you? I know that this is like the cheesiest thing ever, and especially at like uh, an industry event. And we tend not to do these things, but like my five and a half year old loves you. Like I have to do it. Points with him. Like I got it. Dad do this. of the year. Was, yeah. Like, and, and so I, I'm like, look, bud, I got this picture. And he's like, wow. 
Ah! And I'm like, oh, that's nice. That's so sweet. I love that. Points. That's yeah, adorable. But, yeah, but for us, it's all uh, very curated. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're watching everything in advance, and we're making sure that he is only kind of like watching or kind of in the ecosystem that we've created for him on mm-hmm. these platforms. I, you know, I, I worry about a lot of the algorithms and we always hear about like the funnel down and yeah. it leads you to weird places. And and we've seen this, we've run tests on this internally here at Theorist and things like that. And it's, it's not great. So having control over the, there's a lot of great content out there, but making sure that it's kind of like gated and stays in that great content is, is kind of where we're at right now. So, um, my son thinks that YouTube consists of a uh, Supercar Blondie, Heck Mark yeah. Rober videos, and uh, videos where they make vehicles out of matchboxes. Oh, that's cool. Which is a very strange vertical, but very compelling. No, it is compelling. I think I, I used to be really into that when I was like little because Boy Scouts does that. And my brother was in Boy yeah. Scouts. And I was like, Girl Scouts doesn't do that. That This sucks. Like, we should do that. That's way cooler. I was going to say, what are Girl Scouts doing while the Boy Scouts are, are hot gluing together <laughs> Man, matchboxes? Girl Scouts, we did some fun things, you know, but we didn't do as much fun stuff. Like, we did sewing, which is certainly cool. You know, Legit. but now they've just kind of made it into the scouts because, like, mm. I think they realize, like, the boys get to do way more fun stuff. Like, we didn't do – we did, like, glamping. They did, like, sure. real camping. Like, how do you make a fire and stuff? And little girls want to know how to make a fire. I want to know. <laughs> right. I was going to say, who doesn't want to learn how to make a fire? Though, though that being said, like, Boy Scouts – Girl Scouts get to sell cookies. Yeah, that's Boy true. Scouts sell popcorn. Like, yeah. come on, like you, you have you're you have the clear win when it comes to like what you're selling to to fund the Scouts. Absolutely, Girl Scouts are definitely like prepping the MLN girls of tomorrow. Like they're right. like you got the. I used to have to just buy all my own cookies because I was like, I don't I don't like selling stuff, Mom. Sure, I don't like doing it, and I, no, I just want, want all the thin mints. I'll eat them. You know, oh, then, yes. Is that OK? This is probably, in this episode about regulation and monetization <laughs> of online content. Here's the real spiciest take of them all. Best Girl Scout cookie. Go dude, Thin Mints. That's why I said them. They're the best one. Good choice. OK, that's Correct your favorite, choice. too. That is. Oh, Thin Mints closely followed by Tagalongs. That's good. Yeah. That, yeah Every, okay. Everything. Everything else is is, is all right. At best. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Good. They're the ones see, dominating. See, this, this is why we get along so well. This I know. Great. This is why we became immediate friends but immediate back to litigation before yeah, we get yeah, too yeah, distracted by cookies because i will yeah what do you what did the the family vloggers dude what yeah. what do you where do you what do you, what do you, th- what do you think is going to happen with them i mean with all the, the the cases that have been coming out and everything you know i just feel like and it's not just youtubers it's it's tiktokers as well i feel like there's gonna have to be some sort of landmark case where you know similarly to like what happened with shirley temple it's going to have to be yep. some sort of landmark case about like, yeah, we know that it's the parent's channel and like, yeah, your kid who's like three, it's not their channel. So you're not technically breaking community guidelines, but like you are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I 100 percent. I think that is coming. You know, I think you've seen it in fits and starts mm-hmm. over the last couple of years with, you know, COPPA regulations uh, on, on some of the kids content. So, you know, the government's starting to kind of look into the child privacy rights and, mm-hmm. and things on these platforms um you're starting to see more engagement on the platforms around f- figuring out kind of like what channels are, are doing right by the kids versus not but i think you're absolutely right i think like we are on the cusp of one of those litig like i would i would expect one of those cases to arrive fairly soon right because that first generation of family channels and and where the kids were really the star they're all grown up now. Yeah, they're like, all this, turning this 18. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this is this is not, you know, it, it's not a decade ago, right? These kids are all grown up, and, and those six, seven, eight-year-olds are now 16, 17, 18-year-olds, and they're able to see, like, hey, was I comfortable with the way that I was portrayed? Am I, you know, am I profiting off of what my parents were able to earn off of me? Again, like yeah. you call that with Shirley Temple, right? It's, it, is, it is fascinating to look at the history of entertainment and look at YouTube, digital video, TikTok now, and it's it's the same beats in a lot of cases repeating themselves where it's like, well, now we got to clean up this part of it. And, and here we are at, at figuring out how do we handle this? And yeah. so, yeah, I think there's going to come that point where if you are a, a kid and family channel and your kid's appearing regularly on the channel, you're going to have to submit some sort of paperwork or be subject to some mm-hmm. sort of review saying like my child is only on screen for X number of days or, or X number of hours and is only working for X number of time. And they have 
uh, an educator and a tutor who's who's giving them their their lessons and this and that. Like they're getting a full education, mm -hmm. which are all the things that the entertainment industry had to institute. And I think, you know, a lot of that's going to eventually be mapped onto digital. It's just right now there hasn't been the impetus to do it but i think you're right on the cusp of it yeah there hasn't been like the big moment like the person yeah. who becomes like the face of that movement because i mean i i've talked about it a couple times online people get very defensive about it because for a lot of families you know the it's their livelihood like their kid yeah. is really the one who's paying the mortgage you know and so yeah. and, and they're like my kid gets to just review toys and pays the mortgage that's freaking awesome right. like they love it and i definitely like see wanting to be like a good parent so many kids now are it's their dream to be a youtuber but i think there's like two points that i always focus on like one a lot of kids also want to be like firefighters and they're not let mm -hmm. down that they can't be a firefighter today because they right. know you become a firefighter when you're like older so if there was an age limit implemented later, I don't think children would have like the visceral reaction that a lot of parents think that they would have yeah. and, and have like that disappointment if it was just like understood that you have to to wait. And that was like the cultural yeah. norm. Secondly, yeah, we, right now oh, it's just ahead, unregulated child labor. Yeah. Uh, and like people don't like to hear it in that term, but like that that's literally what it is. Yeah. No, totally. It, it, it's wild. So to your point about the, the kids and family channels, we spoke at a convention that was specifically for uh, kids and family channels at one point. And man, let me tell you, it was the group that was the smartest, mm -hmm. most cutthroat, most aggressive of, of any group that we'd ever spoken to and ever consulted with before. Um, it was also interesting, too, because of all the kind of industry events, it was the earliest one that we had ever seen where there were stands and booths dedicated to sell your channel, sell your brand, merchandise. Like it was so much more advanced as a vertical and monetizing that vertical as opposed to basically every other vertical on YouTube. It was very eye opening for us. We're like, oh, wow. And, and it makes sense, right? Whereas a lot of the other verticals are I am a teenager or 20 something who started making videos, live streaming, whatever, and, and just start uploading it or had aspirations to do this. Like you call out, these are adults in a lot of cases who are leaving their jobs and making businesses around their kid or the content that their family's making. And so it's not just, hey, we're doing this for fu the funsies. It's we're doing this for, for profit. And because we're older adults, we understand forming a business and monetization and business structures and, and management and this and that. And so they're applying that much more adult mindset to it and able to expand it treat it like a brand a business whatever and grow it faster which is a very double-edged sword yeah um it was one of those things where after an event that we spoke at it, it was a different convention um but we we get pinned down a lot by people yeah. who want to just talk to us after our speeches and and you know it's it's fine we love it you know we answer all these kind of questions that you can't go into during your normal speech or whatever and there's this one parent who's like hey this is my kid and we run a very successful uh, family channel. You know, she she does X, Y, and Z on her channel. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Good for you guys. Congratulations. We have X million subscribers, this many views. I'm like, that's great. Fantastic. And she's like, yeah, but she doesn't want to do it anymore. Oh. What do I do? And I'm like, well, what does she want to do? And And she's like, well, she wants to not do videos anymore. And I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing videos yeah, anymore. Yeah, that's so sad. Like, like, that's just so sad because, like, that's it's an inherent conflict of interest. Like, you can't you can't be prioritizing your child as their parent anymore when your livelihood is now connected to yeah. their willingness to to work a full time adult job. Yeah, yeah. No, it was one of those moments where I'm like, hey, like, my advice to you is to you know listen to your child be and and allow them to follow their passions because they are still very young and this is not their job and. And she started talking about like getting the younger child in, into the pipeline and this. And I'm like, no, like I'm I'm not gonna tell you to do that. Like this is not okay. Yeah. Like this. And 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 the, the feedback that I tend to give is like, hey, here's the thing. I highly recommend that everyone try making YouTube videos or digital videos, TikToks, whatever, because it is fun. It is a way to learn how to clearly communicate, to be mm -hmm. confident in, your, in yourself, to find your own creative voice, to edit, to research, to write, to script, to perform, to potentially learn analytics and SEO and how the digital online ecosystem functions. Like, yeah, there are so many relevant facets of this business that you can expose young kids to, uh, teenagers to, whatever, and all of them are so valuable and all of them are very fun. 
and it's it is it is not for everyone and nor should people like that young be be subjected to that sort of stuff but if they enjoy it great but when that's done it's like hey those skills will last a lifetime they can find a job at a marketing firm creating like cool assets or editing videos or whatever like that yeah those skills will last I'm sorry that your business might not have happened, like might not be able to persist. And maybe you can find a way to kind of like keep it going through animated content or something else. Yeah, or maybe you like, get on the camera. Yeah. And just right. Or, about yeah, you. Maybe, it, like the views might go down, but like at the end, of, if you want to try to continue doing it, like that's an option. But yeah, no, it is. It is a very, a very difficult situation. And like you said, it's a conflict of interests. And and parents, I think, are really eager to see those those paychecks and and like this is our this is our meal ticket and this and that. It's it's the worst version of kind of like those those theater parents. Yeah, the, the stage day, parents. Right? The stage uh, parents. And know it's like, well. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> it's right? it's tough out there. Like uh, my school had to ban parents from coming backstage just because of that when I was in theater <laughs> and like. It was mainly my mom. Like I love my mom, but she's she's like a she's very she's direct, and so they were yeah. kind of afraid of her. But she meant well, you know. Your mom instituted a, an like because of your mom, like a policy wide. Right? Yeah, no where they were like, don't let her back there. <laughs> they were like, That's we're amazing. afraid of her, and I was like, she's just gonna get back there and and yell at me to curl my hair faster. Don't worry. But um, no, like with with all of this kind of stuff, though, it, it, there's just so many things online with with kids and like with teenagers even like we talked about mm -hmm. this a little bit before but um off camera like i blew up on tiktok before my frontal lobe was closed you blew up right as your frontal lobe was closing yes. like do you ever yep. think about that like are you like thank god it's you know i i never thought about it until the retirement thing yeah. came about and and now that i'm retired one of the questions that i always get across the board is hey how does it feel or like how do you cope as a person when you're no longer a part of your channel or like when your channel yeah. kind of like you don't have that in your life anymore. And at first it was a little bit of a confusing question to me because I'm like, I I'm still me. You know, it's, it's like I started this off, right? Like you can take the, you can take me out of the channel yeah. and and I'm still me, right? It was a distillation of things that I liked. And and that doesn't change just because I'm not putting it in video form and recording an audio about it, right? And, and not putting a hundred hours of editing into it or yeah. whatever. Um, so I had a pretty solid understanding of who I was as a person. I had an established relationship with my wife, Stephanie. I had established friendships that had gone back through my college days. Uh, you know, I, I was still forming and I was still figuring out exactly who I am. And we're always constantly figuring out who we are. Totally. But, but I had, a, you know, I was the guy at the college bus stop who was dancing around in a bright lime green suit with a pink polka dotted tie and, and <laughs> dancing to Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. Like... <laughs> I had no shame. Yeah. I was pretty Classic blissfully unaware. <laughs> yeah, us theater kids, right? I was blissfully unaware of the, the scorn and judgment that the rest of my classmates were hurling in my direction. They're like, you see the lime green guy? He's always out there. <laughs> yeah, right? That, that lime green guy. And it's like, and to this day, it, it persists in the thumbnails. Uh, but it was one of those things where, you know, it, I'm like, you're either hopping on the bus with me or or, or not. You yeah. know, and I, and I don't care, right? So I had that as, as a core tenant of who I am. I had that, that rock, right? And so the channel was just something built on top of that. I think to your point though, about like frontal lobes closing and doing weird things with the brain chemistry, like yes, 100% absolutely when you are a, a teenager and suddenly you're doing this on a regular basis and you're doing this potentially as a full-time job or you, know, you have school and then this is what you're doing nights and weekends. Now all of a sudden, are you finding the time to develop for yourself? Are you finding the time to, to find your own voice and see how you exist minus an audience, minus a channel? Because yeah. it's one thing to be a creator. And I think that it's important to kind of call this point out is you can be a creator and, and make videos and all that stuff. And that's great. But there is something that happens once people start perceiving those videos. Absolutely. And once, once you have comments kind of filtering in and telling you, how great you are or conversely how awful you are and that's why you see a lot of like young musicians young actors let it go to their head buy into their own hype like i'm the best thing in the world and and you know i am i'm godlike and everything i i say and do and touch is is the best thing ever and then when that goes away yeah like ego now death. you're left kind of yeah you're left empty right yeah the parasocial um, relationships two ways and i think a lot of times people who are more audience oriented like they're on that side of it they don't they don't realize how palpable yeah. that is for a lot of creators in real life. 100%. Yeah, it's, it's 
you know, I've, I've been along for a long time. Uh, I'm old man YouTube at this point. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, I, I wasn't a, what I would call a Gen 1 creator. I was Gen 2. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was kind of that first iteration of people who were like YouTubers in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, but I, I consulted a lot of those early people. And you saw that happen, right? Where because this was so new, because millions of views were being funneled to these people who and, and lots of money was being funneled to people who had never experienced a lot of this before, you know, you had that egotism and that like inflated sense of like self and I'm, I'm, you know, I can do anything and like, look at how great I am and look at how untouchable I am. And when that went away for a lot of them and, and it went away for a lot of them with an algorithm. Switch. Yeah, like fast. When it went from, yeah, when it went from like a view based algorithm to a watch time based algorithm, views suddenly cut in half and their audiences disappeared and this and that. And it's like, yeah, what do you, what are you left with? How do you, how do you cope? You know, what, what do you become at that point? And I, I think that's, really important and again i think it's a discussion that isn't being had enough Mm -hmm. i do think that the platforms are old enough at this point that people who are getting in have a better understanding of what they're getting into and are getting in with an intention Mm -hmm. you know they are they are hopping in to become you know the next big brand the next markiplier jimmy you know uh or like ryan trahan or, or someone like that right like they they see it and they're like i i i want to do this job just like people wanted to be astronauts or firefighters or actors back in the day. Right. And like with any industry, there are those moments of, I need to understand, like, I don't have a full understanding of what this actually means to do professionally. Yeah. Um, and it, it'll wash people out. I think, you know, people will be like, Oh, this, this really isn't for me. And I, mm-hmm. I'd rather support this industry rather than be the guy. Um, so I do think that there is some level of, of self-selecting in there. And I think there is some level of education as you get exposed to the realities of a, what it means, but yeah, talking about it and, and, getting that core sense of self outside of this and not being dictated by numbers and comments and things like that is tremendously important for anyone who's getting on these platforms. Absolutely. You have to be grounded and have your people who have been there yes. always and, you know, just love you and have been there or, and and care. Do you feel like because this is something I always want to ask like creators and you have such like a huge audience. When you started seeing success on YouTube, you started seeing yourself on camera did it affect the way that you see yourself, like your physical self? Did it make you like feel a, more comfortable in yourself or did you feel more insecure? Like, did Because for me, people started pointing out things that I never even considered about myself, like visually, where I was like, <laughs> oh, you guys hate that? What the hell? Yeah, you're noticing that one. Uh, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I didn't appear on camera for a long time. Yeah. Um, I had a, I had a cutout and I still have my little cutout. Yeah. He dances around and he does his thing and he's thinking, of, he's thinking about stuff. Uh, um, which was a, comp- you know, that picture was just arbitrarily chosen mm-hmm. by, by my editor at the time. And I'm like, sure, we'll go with this. And like, yeah. Little did I know 13 years later, I'd still be like, sure, we're still going to go with this. <laughs> uh, we're going to keep it. It's perfect. Uh, cut and print. Um, but it's one of those things where, and it, it's one of those things where, uh, my voice was the big one. Um, oh, in those really? early days are whenever I would do videos on our channel, People were totally fine with the voice. People like the voice. Like it's no no comments whatsoever. Whenever I would collab with someone else, I would do voiceover for another channel, or I would make a cameo over on a, on a different like live action channel or whatever. I would be like, I hate his voice. His voice is the worst. You have a oh, great voice. The... Oh, thank you. No, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but no, like back in the day, like people really despised it, and it and it Damn. like coming out of theater. I think you and I probably can relate where theater is a medium where you're constantly being scrutinized anyway yeah. and you have someone whose job it is to literally critique you to death until you are like the perfect version of the performance yeah right? you just and have so, to be like thank you so much for telling me yeah. i sucked at that I, that was really yeah. valuable and thank it you is for the note. Th- yeah thank you for the note i mean it, it's valuable until it's not and, and then you're sent crying in behind a dumpster in the middle of tennessee which yeah. is definitely something that happened to me at one point <laughs> or like where, you have a director who just hates you and you're like they, yeah oh y- yep they just hate everything yeah, I do. There's a reason I don't do theater anymore. Same. <laughs> or at least I, I collect with theater. Yeah. But, you know, you're you're like on stage and you're like, thank you for the note. Thank you for the note. Thank you for the note. And you're and just you're crying. Like, you're like, that was great. Yeah. The, right. Solid tear down Like, here I thought like, I was talking to the back of the house, but I yeah. will scream next time. Uh, yeah. No, there was, there was definitely like, you know, you have really great directors out there and you have directors who are just petty and want to take out their own personal frustrations on you. And you are just hired and there's definitely a power dynamic and you are like, okay, I need to go process some th- stuff behind the dumpster right now. <laughs> um, so like, you know, I, I had faced a lot of that, but no, it, it absolutely hurts. And I think, 
whereas for me like the voice stuff i'm like there's nothing i could do about that i think it's also there were the comments that always got to me around like oh he doesn't do his research oh oh, they're lazy and and knowing from our side i'm like no we do you don't do your research (laughs) yeah and it's because of like the one small thing that like you either misspeak about or you didn't clarify right or you thought you just knew and didn't think that you had to like double check double the research check on that one point or whatever right and but it's like the whole thing's invalidated that really yeah. got to me i um, identify with that especially because and, and also then people are like you're spreading misinformation you're like that's right. my nightmare like that's literally yeah. and if you're somebody who reads a lot also like uh, for my videos my research process involves a lot of reading and i'm dyslexic yeah. so i pronounce things wrong mm-hmm. all the time and then yeah. people are like, she see, she doesn't even freaking know. And I'm like, no, I read like 800 pages on this. Like, I just have never heard it said out loud. I'm sorry. I should have, right. I should have looked that up. And now, I, now I always look up like pronunciation videos, and it's like oh, toad. Yeah. And I'm like, toad, got it. Okay, yeah. had to make sure I wasn't <laughs> Pro- sure. Pro- that being said, those pronunciation videos are also garbage. They're like, so like, let's terrible. Be, let's be- they're so terrible and it's all it's they're the worst like no, no offense to any pronunciation channels out there yeah the robot voices they're not pronouncing it right like no way either it's either the google voice that's pronouncing it right or i go to like webster's but it is there's a lot of stuff out there that is hard to find it's painful absolutely especially yeah, in different it's, it's languages brutal. like you want to know a french word give up right give up literally no clue no, yeah absolutely no but um but the uh I, I've I've fallen into that boat as well, and it's it is it's it's so endlessly frustrating. Or worst case scenario of all of them is because we were we deal with with theorists and IP that we cover. Mm-hmm. We're always dealing with the most intense fandoms, and a lot of times fandoms have their own established canon that might not yeah. actually be real. And so there is a collective assumption that this thing has been solidified in the canon or this thing is a thing that appears or we all collectively agree that this is the way this universe should work so when we as a neutral third party try to come in and and do the research and say like hey this doesn't actually exist as a thing or like this this idea that you believe is built on kind of a bunch of assumptions and and jumps of conclusion and this and that you're, you're suddenly the bad guy there too because you're yeah. like raining on everyone's parade and you're like ah oh, sorry and you're guys. like i love that canon though and you're like that's okay yeah. i'm not i'm just giving like a timeline of everything that actually happened yeah yeah all, all canons are beautiful canons but some are correct canons <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly actually um this is i don't know what this made me think of loot boxes because like i don't know why canons are related to that besides like maybe the pirate <laughs> angle i think that's I what say, it is launch, launching loot boxes yeah. out of canons i see that as a thing pirates but loot boxes Arr, have been kind of be like loot. they've been disappearing a little bit they were everywhere but i think it's because they got they got sent to court but they do yeah. it does bring up another topic that I, I i would love to get your opinion on which is sure. like sort of like gambling or like gambling adjacent things being normalized online especially like directed at kids yeah what do you do you think we're gonna get away with that as like a whole or do you think they're gonna have to just get rid of it or what okay i don't i i did research and i don't know what you're trying to get away but when you say we are we getting away with this i i don't mean like us oh, so i just mean <laughs> yeah. like society i've we, never done a loot box it? ad or anything uh, where, where, where's our where's our kick guarantees man yeah. let's, hop, let's hop on over are we press slot are you and i gonna was... get away with our this casino is... deal that we have yeah. or... like this, this podcast is all well and good but i'm retired and there's a bunch of there's a bunch of casinos <laughs> out there that we could just film ourselves hitting those buttons and flashing those lights right exactly but like seriously though like what do you and and like with like the sports gambling sites and so like do, yeah. do you think there's going to be like any like major like pendulum swing there or is that just going to become like a facet of the internet no, I, th- I think I think it's going to have to, you know, I, I think there's probably going to be age opt-ins yeah. in a lot of cases, like age gating around that sort of stuff. Again, we are operating at such a fast rate and it's evolving so quickly that it is hard to keep up, right? Like yeah. I earlier this year, I was supposed to go to Capitol Hill to educate a bunch of lawmakers about what it means to be an online influencer, right? And, and yeah. what it means to be a creator, a creator business and when you think about it, right, like oh, lawmakers are so out of touch to not know that, but it's it's actually a really complicated question. Yeah, I mean, it, it ranges from I'm a, a TikTok creator doing videos on my phone independently on weekends mm-hmm. to hey, I'm Mr. Beast spending ten million dollars on a video and a crew of two hundred. Yeah, you know, so and and all of them are under the same moniker of influencer, YouTuber, online content creator, right? 
but they are vastly different scales. Totally. And so it is, it's, it's complicated. Um, unfortunately that, that meeting has been kicked down the line yeah, same. A, a bunch of times <laughs> indefinitely. So we'll see what comes of it. I think it's a very worthwhile conversation for, for lawmakers to have. It is. But when, when the conversation still isn't happening in the year of 2024, and is happening like, you know, and, and, and that's where you're starting yeah. getting to the minutia of, oh, yeah. And by the way, here's a whole vertical dedicated to watching people play slot machines. And kids are watching this for like six hours on end in the background while they're doing homework. And maybe there's some bad, bad signs to that. Maybe there's some yeah. negative effects to that. You know, like it's it is so many levels of conversation removed and so many levels of conversation that have you have to get to in order to do it. The way you speed it up, right? is if you're a platform and if if you're a platform who is like hey this is probably not content that we should be you know showing to kids or it's advertisers being like hey i'm seeing a lot of young kids watching this stuff and i don't want my ads playing on this the problems there though are it is fundamentally opposed to the the, the best interests of the platform right yeah. where if people are watching this and they're putting on long watch sessions of this this gambling content loot boxes unwrappings casino you know reels what have you there's there's tons of it out there and it comes in all these different forms you know it is it's a question of like well people are watching it and it's and i don't technically have to regulate it and it gets a lot of views and a lot of watch time so uh, you know like if we if we police it or if we age gate it or something like that now all of a sudden we as a platform are undercutting our views and our watch on our, our our watch time and, mm -hmm. and do we want that you know, chances are no, because that hurts our bottom line. Yeah, they want so the it's, it's a, addictive component of it. Right. It's Yeah, I, it, it feels to me like we are at c coming up on an age where there will have to be more restrictions and warnings on the things that we consume, right? And, and I say this coming off of uh, like a couple weeks ago, I was at a gas station and I was paying at the counter and I saw behind the gas station counter – all the cigarettes, the the tobacco wall, and and signs everywhere around like this is this is dangerous for your health. Uh, and there was one that stood out to me as like this product is designed to addict you. Mm. It has enough nicotine in it to addict you. And and I thought that was a really interesting phrasing of it because it showed not just like oh general health warning or like oh this is dangerous yeah. for you, but like the intent. this is intentional. Yeah, it's the intent. And and that was a really compelling sign that I thought was interesting. And I feel like. We're going to have to do that with mobile games, with loot boxes, with with caffeine, to be honest. Like yeah. I look at like one of the things that really has infuriated me over the last year of videos that we've done. We uh, Last year was kind of the year of caffeine yeah. for us over on Food Theory, where it was a big trend and we were covering energy drink, the surge of energy drinks. Uh, we were covering uh, new caffeinated beverages and we were also covering like uh, – the, the Panera lemonade yeah. where Panera is offering this charged lemonade and they weren't disclosing in a very transparent way that this lemonade had a ton of caffeine in it. In fact, it had so much caffeine. It was like 10, 20 milligrams just under the FDA recommended limit for a day. Yeah. And they're like, here's free refills. Go, go ham guys. Like we're going to, it's like the teeniest, tiniest print. Uh, oh, it's got an, as much caffeine as like a very strong dark roast coffee free refills. Um, and so you had all these health effects coming out of the other end. But the thing is, right, like caffeine is addictive. Like we feel compelled to it makes us feel good. It makes us feel productive. It makes us feel awake. And, you know, I feel like you've seen more and more products seeding in caffeine because it's like, well, it, it's kind of a slow way of addicting people. Like I'm a, I, I make a joke about it, but it's not really a joke that I'm addicted to caffeine and in diet Coke, like yeah. I'm addicted to diet Coke and I feel myself compelled to like drink more of it. And again, is that one of those things where it's like, Hey, this has just enough caffeine designed to addict you. This has just enough do like dopamine hits mm -hmm. in its algorithm designed to like addict you to the feed. To yeah. The Social media is exactly tapping into that exact thing. Yep. And unfortunately we're running out of time. So it's where we have to close out, but <laughs> I'm Thank so you sorry. so yeah. no no don't worry. Thank you so much for coming on and I really hope since you're supposed to rep for YouTube and I'm supposed to rep for TikTok that they do stop pushing back these Capitol Hill meetings cuz obviously we both have a lot to say about litigation in this space. Is there anything yeah. that you you need to plug before we close out? 
Uh, do, is there anything I need to plug? Not, not particularly. I mean, I didn't think um, so since you're retiring, but who knows? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a retired guy. But if, hey, if you want to support the theorist channels on YouTube, like the new, the new creative directors, the new hosts are are crushing it right now. They're doing a great job, kind of taking what what I've built and kind of carrying it into the next generation. And hey, if you like the you know, like bright colored clothing with with a lot of flowers all across it. Uh, we've got our, our Lumen merch line that just came out. And it's very Heck nice. Yeah, so I was admiring the shirt the whole time, actually. So that's Thank a you. perfect plug because I was looking we, at we it. Made, we made it ourselves. Yep. That's Lumen really it's nice. Com. It's really nice. Thank you, Thank you Thank so you. much, Matt Pat. This was great. Oh I gosh. hope to have you come on again just because like we're buds. I would, I, would, I would love to. And, and maybe next time it could be in person or, you know, yeah. because the video is nice and crispy. That works, too. But uh, no, this was this was a delight. I love the fact that you are asking the questions that people should be asking uh, when you. it relates to this this industry, because there's a lot of stuff happening right now, and there's a lot of kind of challenging conversations that have to happen. So thank you for for fighting the good fight out there. And thank you. you want to <laughs> pontificate about it together, I am here with slightly more time on my hands. Heck to yeah! Talk about it. I'll call you. <laughs> awesome. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much. What? Absolutely. <laughs> Daisy, that's the name Paul, followed by the gale. I ain't ever seen you.